allow me to serve as your sheriff. I love this job. It is to this day the funnest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I am truly blessed to be surrounded by a great team that are knocking it out of the park out there to keep you safe. So, as I always tell everybody, I don't care who you see from our agency, whether it's one of our patrol deputies, one of our corrections deputies, one of our telecommunicators or dispatchers, the person makes our computer come on or the person that logs our evidence in, you let them know how much you appreciate what they're doing because they're doing a tremendous job out there for you. I have, uh, I have two of them with me today. Um, they're not two of the good ones, all right? We have some bad ones, uh, but I'm, I'm trying to bring them along, all right? So I, uh, I have uh, Lindsay, who really needs no introduction because uh, uh, she runs all of our social media, our community relations, our crime prevention, um, all under her. So please give Lindsay a big round of applause. <laughs> And I have new to our crime prevention unit, but certainly not new to our agency. He's been with us about 15 years. Um, he's done everything from investigations to bomb assignment, um, which I would never do. Um, <laughs> if they say there's a bomb in, in uh, MIMS, I go down south to Melbourne. Um, but, uh, um, uh, he's uh, just, uh, just recruited him to come into our crime prevention unit. Jay Martinez, who was with us, got promoted to sergeant, and uh, so uh, I asked Jay Church to come in. I got the same name, that way I don't mess him up. And, uh, uh, Jay has already hit the ground running. He's doing a great job for us and uh, has already picked up all the presentations with his vast knowledge of what we do and everything. So please give Jay a big round of applause. <laughs> so on the way over, um, I, um, I decided what I was going to talk to you about, if it was okay with you guys, and you know I'll always open the floor to questions and stuff, but... What I was going to talk to you about is school security. It seems to be ever present on everybody's mind right now. And uh, I'm going to tell you that even before Parkland happened, uh, we, had, we had already gone into to gear in Brevard County to try and make our schools as safe as, as possible. Um, Parkland um, uh, put it on steroids, um, certainly. But um, uh, as far back as um, I had just been elected sheriff, in fact, I hadn't even taken office yet when Newtown, Connecticut happened. And I, I went and met with our then school board superintendent and said, hey, I don't want that here. I want, to, <clears throat> I want to be able to keep that from ever happening in our community. So we started looking at what we could do right then. And uh, one of the things we did was create strategic response plans for each one of our schools. Um, uh, started pushing out training um, for, for our, our teachers, our educators. And believe it or not, um, we continued that. And some of, some of our um, administrators resisted the training. They didn't want to scare their staff. They didn't want to. They didn't want to make them paranoid and everything. And I'm a big believer in that paranoia will save your life. Right? Because if you're not smart enough to be scared of something, you're not very smart. So um, you know, it's like I tell everybody when I ride a motorcycle. I get on a motorcycle all the time. I love it, but I'm petrified to death when I'm on it because that's what keeps me safe. So you know, I I, I pushed it out. Well, when Parkland happened, then we kicked into another year. And what, what we found is this, that um, when, when you look across the board, and I'm not just talking about our schools, I'm talking about across the nation, um, school security hasn't really changed. In fact, um, I did a 12-minute video, and one of the things I pointed out in the video is a lot of people think the very first school shooting we had was in 1999 with Columbine. It wasn't. The very first school shooting that's documented in history goes back to 1764 at a province in Pennsylvania where four Indian warriors went into a schoolhouse, killed the, the schoolmaster and nine kids. They had one shot. They used it to kill the schoolmaster, and then they scalped the nine kids and killed them. And that was in 1764. Now, fast forward to today, and we haven't done a single thing different. All right? We're not protecting our schoolhouses anymore. Some years back, we started putting school resource deputies in there. But most people don't realize school resource deputies were not put in place to be a security component. They were put in place to handle the problems that were happening on campus as a law enforcement component. And so when Parkland happened, everybody jumped into a different gear. Now, I'm a big believer in don't react to things. Government has a, uh, is very famous for reacting. And you saw that happen in Tallahassee to some great degree after this. I don't want to react. I want to respond. And there's a big difference between those two. And so what we did is I sat down with Dr. Blackburn. I sat down with our school board members. And we put together a four-layer plan. And I call that plan our school's bulletproof vest. If you know anything about a bulletproof vest, it's layer after layer after layer of material that when woven together becomes so strong, a bullet or an edged weapon won't go through it. But one layer by itself or two layers are not sufficient enough to stop it. It takes layer after layer after layer. So we created four layers of security for our schools. And each one of them is vital. 
The first layer is education and awareness. You show me a problem in society today, and I'll show you that education and awareness will be part of the solution. Somewhere, it'll be part of it. So in our education and awareness component, it's no longer an option to learn what we call the four A's of survival. And I've talked to this group I know before about the four A's of survival. It's no longer an option. It is mandatory now that every teacher, every administrator, every faculty member, every employee that's on a campus or goes to, to work, in fact, every employee of the school board, and every volunteer goes through the four A's of survival training. I want them to know what to do in, a, in an actual active shooter scenario. Then we shift to how do we educate the students? And a lot of people said, oh, we're going to scare the students to death. Well, I'm looking around this room, and I'm pretty fair, fairly sure that most of you in this room will remember like I do when we had nuclear drills in schools against nuclear attacks. How many remember that? Were we scared to death? Did it stop us from learning? No. You know why? Because we had parents and teachers that were bookending us saying, it's okay, we're here, we're gonna take care of you, we're gonna protect you. And so, just like that, we've gotta get the message to our children today. It's just a different type of threat. That's all it is, all right? It's just, in fact, when we talk about the nuclear, the nuclear war and the Cold War, most of us probably would put that at a level above what we're facing with these individual active shooters. So, what, we, what we've gotta do now is get the message out. So we're delivering it at our high schools. Jay teaches a program called College Bound Safety. We put that into our high school curriculum and what we teach our high school students. Getting to teach the younger kids in the, in the K and first, second, third, fourth grade, that's a little bit tricky because we gotta teach them in a little different method. So we're putting together a video that we're actually using a student as the teacher and the student's actually teaching adults who are sitting in the school desk on what they should do in the event of an active shooter. We think the kids will absorb that a little bit better. <laughs> then we're gonna put in drills and the drills are just like fire drills. We do fire drills quarterly in our schools. Somebody tell me the last time we had a fire in school. Now, there's two ways to look at that. You could say, well, it's a waste of time to drill for fires. Or you could say, the drilling is what's kept fires from happening. So we're gonna drill. We're gonna put these kids and these teachers and these faculty members through drills on a quarterly basis. We're gonna make sure that they know what to do when that critical incident happens, and then we're gonna pray that it never happens. But we're gonna be prepared. We can't wait for the emergency to happen to go into action. We have to go into action right now. And so that's what we're doing on the education awareness. There's two other parts of it. One part is called Operation Speak Out. It's through Crime Line. It's a P3 app that goes on the phone. The kids, the teachers, the parents, everybody can use it to report. You know, we, we thrive on if you see something, say something. Well, that's what that app is about. It's through Crime Line. It doesn't cost us anything. And I will tell you, Crime Line covers Orange, Osceola, Seminole, Lake, Indian River, Volusia, all of those areas. Brevard County has the most contributions to uh, Operation Speak Out of any other of the counties. So we're, we're having more tips come in than Orange County, even given their vast size difference between us, because our team's pushing it out and we're getting our students involved. That's what we want. We want those students to tell us when something's going on. We got a case right now happening in Rockledge where the students are telling about a kid that brought a gun to school. Um, you had a kid um, down in Bayside, just um, what, two weeks ago, I think that one happened. Down in Bayside, another kid brought a gun to school. This kid sees that he's got a gun waits till he's busy, they were in some type of um, uh, 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 practical class, waits till he's busy, grabs a jacket, goes and gets the gun out of the backpack and runs to the principal's office with the gun and gives it to him and says, this kid brought this to school. <laughs> that kid's a hero. <laughs> all right, that, kid, that kid's got guts, all right? And that's, that's man, I applaud that. In fact, you're gonna be seeing, seeing me very quickly give that kid an award. And somebody else said, oh, well, you'll, you'll, if you give him an award, they'll say he's a rat. What? No, he's a hero, all right? He's, he's somebody who knows how to save lives. That's what I'm gonna reward for. So, but, so we got Operation Speak Out, then we got another program that I think you're gonna like. It's called STAR. And STAR is at the Alternative Learning Center. The Alternative Learning Center where kids that are behavioral problems that disrupt class go is a babysitting camp. That's all it is. They take them out of the regular school because they can't behave and they put them at the school up here in Cocoa off of Clear Lake. And they say, okay, you're gonna be there for five weeks. They don't learn anything there. They don't change their behavior, they don't do anything. In fact, most of them would rather be there than in their regular school. Well, we changed that game. I donated two members of our agency to the school board. One of them is Lieutenant Robbie Stokes from our jail. Robbie's a former drill instructor, former military. Um, he has the ability, I've never seen anybody like Robbie. He can make kids hate him in the first five minutes they meet him, and by the end of the day, they don't want to leave him there in love with him. They think he's, they think he's the awesome, most awesome thing they've ever seen. So he's one of the things that I've given the school board. The other one 
is what I believe, and in fact, I, I don't think I'm wrong on this, the meanest woman on the planet. Right? <laughs> her, her name is Sissy McLaughlin. Actually, her real name is Linda, but we call her Sissy. Sissy McLaughlin's former military, uh, Marine Corps, I believe. I think Sissy got her Marines. Um, and uh, she's the meanest woman on the planet. And she is actually Lieutenant Stokes backup. All right, the kids are more scared of her than they are him. Uh, but the two of them are a great team. And what I will tell you is that their job is to take those kids that have behavioral issues. When you go to that alternative learning center now, when they get off the bus, when they step off the bus, they're wearing a uniform, a military style uniform. They are, they are to, to stand every morning as we raise the flag in honor of our country. They're taught to do the Pledge of Allegiance. They're taught to do drills. They are taught to behave. If they get out of line in class, they go deal with sissy. They are, they are not wanting to do that. And I'm telling you right now, we are already, we've only been in operation six months, and we're already seeing our numbers decline and the kids that are return offenders coming back to that. It also works in this regard. It's an intervention tool because some kids are behavioral issues. Other kids have mental health issues. And this team is able to pick that out and say, this is not a behavioral issue. This is a mental health issue. We need to do something different here. And if you flip back to Parkland, 34 missed opportunities, 34 missed intervention opportunities to have saved 17 kids' lives. And I'm not being critical of anybody down there because I don't know the whole story, and I, I'll reserve comment for that. But what I can tell you is I would like to think here in Brevard County that our team would not have missed 34 opportunities. I, I don't believe we would. All right, And I, I say that as a credit to our team that, that puts their lives on the line every day protecting, protecting you and I. So that's, that's the educational awareness component. That's a lot just in one component, isn't it? Second component of it, or second layer, is a hardening of our facilities. All of our campuses right now, everybody here is familiar with at least one, maybe two, two <coughs> campuses out of our community. All of them are large campuses. All of them, at any given time, I can walk on or off the campus from probably five to seven different entry points. That's a problem. So we're using some of the half cent sales tax money to put fencing up, to put cameras up. The fencing, somebody said, well, is fencing that important? Fencing in itself is not that important because I can cut through the fence. But what fencing does is help me create what is important, and that's a single entry access point. So I put that single entry access point into play. I can control what comes into the environment. That's what this is all about, controlling what comes in. Now, a lot of people have said, well, why not put metal detectors up at those single entry access points? Well, first of all, you have to have somebody to man the, the, uh, the uh, metal detector. Secondly, if somebody comes in to have something on them, now that person is taken away to deal with it. Who's dealing with the rest of the students? The biggest issue for me, though, is when we put that, that metal detector up, it slows the ingress of everybody getting into the school. And so what we do unintentionally is create what we call in our business a fatal funnel. All the children are now backed up standing there. So if I'm a, if I'm a person with evil in my heart, that's my opportunity to strike is while everybody's backed up there. So we have to be careful not to overdo ourselves in what we're trying to, to um, come into play here. So also, another problem, we have 4,000 classrooms in New York County. Overwhelmingly, those 4,000 classrooms have two common features, glass in the door, and the door's locked from the outside, not the inside. So they're designed to keep somebody from coming in the classroom and stealing supplies versus keeping somebody outside from coming in and stealing lives. So we're trying to fix that. Now somebody said, well, you can do it with a deadbolt. Well, the deadbolt doesn't work when all I gotta do is shoot this out and now I can reach through. So we're having to be a little more creative than that. We're also having to look at cost, 4,000 classrooms. That's a pretty big number to change the locking mechanisms on. So there's a couple devices out there that we're looking at. One works off of a scissor arm. It's a, it's a tube that goes over the scissor arm. You latch it down with Velcro and then the scissor can't open up so the door can't open up. You would think those would be about $10 a piece, $130 a piece. Uh, so um, there's another one that goes under the door. And once it goes under, you slide two bars out, and it keeps the door from being open. It basically creates a trap for it. Um, those are about $140. Um, I'm looking at the possibility once we, in fact, we've ordered both of those mechanisms. We're going to look at the materials and everything else. Um, and there's, there could be, I'm just saying this out loud, there could be a little copyright violation because I'm going to use inmate labor to build something like that <laughs> um, and, uh, and, try and uh, try and try and put those into play. I'm trying to do everything I can to save money for our community and use inmates to do that with. There's another one out there that's really kind of neat, and it may be the cheapest way to go, depending on what the doors look like. But um, on a door that's just got a regular turn handle, it's just a cable 
a loop that goes around it, and then it attaches to an eye bolt over here and keeps them from being able to come in the door. Again, the problem with that may be that if they have um, the, the window shut out. But what I'm thinking is if we put an eye bolt down here and an eye bolt down here, then they can't get to it because they'll be, they won't be able to reach through it. So we're, we're looking at different ways, but it's a problem. Being able to secure 4,000 classrooms is a problem. So that's our second layer, hardening. The third layer, and what I believe is the most vital layer of our plan, is being able to put a school resource deputy or officer on each and every campus in our schools. Now, you hear me say deputy or officer, and the reason for that is if I put them on the campus, they're a deputy. If Melbourne PD puts them on the campus, they're an officer, and, and we both share that responsibility, and all of our, our um, local partners do. So when we start talking about that, what's important to remember is that currently today, we have 37 school resource deputies or officers on our campuses. We have 88 public schools. All right, so just on the public schools, if we don't include charter schools, which we would, we want to protect all of our schools. If we don't include charter schools, then what we're looking at is 51 additional law enforcement officers to put on our campuses at $130,000 each. And somebody said, wow, they make $130,000? No, they don't. They deserve that, but they don't make that. Their salaries and benefits total up to about 70,000. The rest of that figure is cars, bulletproof vests, uniforms, guns, computers, radios, um, training, all of that stuff. So it's $130,000 startup cost. Right now, the state in Tallahassee is saying, hmm, we gave them enough money to do it. That's a lie, they did not, all right? And, and they're saying it's not an unfunded mandate. Well, let me tell you something. It may not be an unfunded mandate, but it is certainly an underfunded mandate. Because I can tell you that there's not enough money in that pot for Brevard County for us to put a deputy at every school. There's just not. And I'm, I'm working every, every way I can with the schools. In fact, I will tell you that my team has come up with a plan where we're asking the school to pay 52000 of the 130000 and I'm eating the rest in my budget. And it's, hard, it's a hard pill for me to swallow. However, it's one I believe I need to swallow so we can protect our schools. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, why don't you just pay for it yourself? Well, we have to protect outside the school before we can protect in the school. And so we have to, we have to do it. But that's, that's only one problem. The funding is only one side of this equation. The second side of this equation is, right now, the Brevard County Sheriff's Office is 25 deputies short. So when I talk about responding to calls out here, we're doing it collectively throughout the 78 mile county with 25 fewer deputies than we should be staffed with. And the reason for that is because Orange County and Orlando pay $10,000 more than what we pay starting salary. So I get deputies here, train them for two years, they go over there and make $10,000 more and they give them a signing bonus to come over there. And they let them live in this county. So they're benefiting from our low economy <coughs> and they're making $10,000 more over there and driving their car back and forth. And I don't blame them. I mean, like I said, I wish I could pay our team what, you know, what they truly deserve, $100,000, but we can't. And that's okay, we understand that, our team understands that. But it still puts me in a deficit of law enforcement officers. Now, let's cross-pollinate that to the other agencies. Melbourne PD is 20 officers short. I have 1,500 members. 25 is a lot, but it's not the percentage of what Melbourne PD is facing with as small as agency as they are. They're 20 officers short. Palm Bay is seven, all right? And I can go throughout, Titusville six. Collectively, with all of our local partners, we are 83 law enforcement officers short of full staffing in Brevard County. Now add the number 51 to that, and then tell me where I find them at. Because if I advertise for Jay Church's job after I fire him later this week, right? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you already knew my bad. <laughs> If I fire Jay and I advertise, <laughs> check your email, it should be there. If I fire Jay and I advertise for his position, I promise you I'll get 100 applicants. No question about it. I may get three of them through our background process. One of those three won't make it through Academy, and the other one, before they actually come to work for me, somebody else is stealing from me. So I end up with one out of 100 is about our margin. So we're, we're at a deficit of 83. Now I'm going to add 51 to that. So the, the issue is not necessarily funding as much as it is having the human capital to fill those positions. And then there's one more significant problem. If I hired Jay today to come to work for us, I've decided I made a mistake and I hire him back. He goes to the police academy for seven months and then he has 12 weeks of field training. 
So it will be one calendar year from the day I hire him until the day I put him into operation. Mm -hmm. One calendar year. August 5th is the date that they set for us. So when the legislature says, oh yeah, we gave him a funded mandate, they underfunded that mandate significantly. All right, in fact, Brevard County's ch um, <clears throat> chunk of that is 2.4 million to put 51 more additional officers on board. Do the math, doesn't work, all right? There's no way it works. So then we get to layer four. And layer four is certainly the one that's developed the most um, uh, conversation and, and to say the least controversy. Layer four is the Marshall program. I call it STOMP, all right? Sheriff trained on-site Marshall program. And essentially what it does is it takes select individuals off the campuses that volunteer, they have to volunteer, that's in the state statute. Once they volunteer, they go through a vetting process with us. That includes a drug screen, it includes a psychological, which is completely different than our psychological because when you're applying to be a deputy sheriff, we give you a psychological. If you pass it, we don't hire you because you have to be crazy to do this. So <laughs> we, we, we don't hire you. So we're, we're actually looking for people that can pass it in this one. It's a whole different, different thing. But what, what we're doing is we're putting them through a drug screen, psychological, a significant online or a significant um, oral interview, and then that's what the state mandates. Okay, the state mandates to be a marshal, you have to go through that. I added another layer to that. I want the principal's input <clears throat> because I promise you, there are people that can get through the vetting. There are people that can get through the training. There's 176 hours of training goes with this program. 176 hours. All right, um, that's put on by me and our team. 176 hours. I promise you, there's people who get through the vetting and can get through the training. And I also promise you that some of those people, if I went to the principal and said, hey, I'm thinking about giving this person a gun, they would say, oh my gosh, I'm gonna give this person keys to the school. Why would you do that? So I want that principal to tell me the responsibility levels of each person that's participating in this program. So when you look at the 176 hours of training, we jacked ours up, all right? They're gonna shoot 20% um, more rounds through their firearm than law enforcement officers have to to qualify. They have to have a 10% higher score than law enforcement officers have to have to qualify. They're gonna shoot, um, shoot, don't shoot simulators, which puts them in situations where they have to make split second decisions on whether or not to defend their lives. Their only purpose on the campus is to engage in an active shooter. They have no law enforcement responsibility. Their only purpose is to engage in an active shooter and they'll be carrying and concealed. There are a lot of people, I, 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 I shouldn't even say a lot, there's a select group out there of people that have decided this is the end of the world if we do this, all right? And, and they're saying, there are literally people that have said, you need to teach them, instead of giving them guns, you need to teach them de-escalation training. Oh, oh, all right? No, I'm sorry, I'm not. And, and you know, the, the paper just the other day wrote an editorial that said, what about the good guy without a gun at the Waffle House? Well, first of all, the good guy without a gun at the Waffle House is a hero, all right? He is an absolute hero. And, and, I, I wish I could shake that man's hand because what, what an amazing person. But we cannot overlook the fact that before he was able to go into action because of what appears to be a malfunction on the gun, four people died. That's an unacceptable body count to me. I don't want four people to die. I don't want one person to die. If we can neutralize or eliminate the threat before it takes place, that's acceptable to me. Now we have to look, yes, it puts risk on campuses. Anybody would say that. Does it increase liability? Sure it does. But you have to look at the liability from two different angles. Angle number one is, yes, if there's an accident, school board's gonna be sued and I'm gonna be sued because I'm responsible, I'm training them. But what if we don't act? And then there's a parkland that happens here. Where's the liability there? Where's the liability to look at this mandate and say, nah, we're not gonna comply? Because the mandate says there will either be a deputy or an officer on each campus or there will be a marshal on each campus. And so we had no choice. Now here's what happened in the aftermath of that, because that's our four layers. And the, quite frankly, the fourth layer is a fail safe. If layers one, two, and three fail, that is the fail safe <coughs> for us. But what happened is because it consumed the conversation, our school board couldn't focus on the, the memorandum of understanding we were giving them about the school resource deputies, because that's the most important part. It's also the most uh, a, a part that I have to move on the quickest because I got to start recruiting deputies to fill these 51 positions or, or my part of those. And so what they do, the school board, because they were so overwhelmed with this other, they, they put the MOU of law enforcement officers on the back burner and started focusing on the other. And so I, in good conscience, could not allow one layer, in fact, a layer that was designed as a fail safe 
to slow down the implementation of the other three layers. So I recommended to them that they table the Marshall program, the STOP program as we call it, until such time as the other three layers had been voted on and implemented, and then we could come back. But even with that recommendation, they decided not to do that. They continued to, to focus on that, they're continuing to do it. And, and I applaud them because I think they truly see the importance of all four layers. But I gotta get, uh, and I think we're there, I think they're gonna vote May 8th on all of it. But I have told them, even though I recommended tabling the stop program until we could focus on the other three, if you vote to implement it, I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna get these, these educators through training. Now a lot of people say, well should a teacher re really be carrying a gun? Well, let me say this first of all. I wish none of us had to have this conversation but it's a real commentary on the society we live in today. So we all have to have this conversation. But classroom teachers are not even eligible by design of the statute. If their sole purpose on a campus is to, is to teach kids in a classroom, they don't qualify by statute. However, and I can't explain the logic of this, if they're a classroom teacher who also has bus loop duty in the morning, now they qualify. If they're a classroom, oh, it's better. The examples they gave was if they're a classroom teacher and they also are the head of the debate club, they qualify. So if they have any other ancillary duty, they qualify. But here's my, my take on it. I got a teacher in a classroom with 30 kids and something bad starts happening. I don't want that teacher to leave those 30 kids. I want them to help secure those 30 kids. My first round draft pick for this position are those that are walking around the campus on a regular basis. Maybe it's the principal, maybe it's the vice principal, maybe it's the dean, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's the custodian. I don't care who they are, I care about their responsibility levels. And my actual best first round draft pick is somebody that's former military or former law enforcement. And when I look at those people, you know who those best people are? On our high school campuses are our ROTC commanders. All of them have been there. They have, they have carried the patch of honor and protection. So those are my first round draft picks. Those are the ones that we're working on. But I can tell you that for right now, May is coming. And there's, there's been a force out there that has been saying, don't do this, I'm gonna pull my kids out of, out of school. All right, and what I've tried to tell those people is, so you're gonna pull your kids out of public school where we are fortifying our schools. Well, where are you gonna put them? You gonna take them to the private schools? Because I promise you, those with evil in their heart, when these schools are fortified and they no longer feel they can walk on that campus and not be <coughs> shot back at, they're gonna to turn to those other schools. And our private schools know it. All right, in fact, I'll tell you this. Our private schools, Holy Trinity just signed a contract with me to give them a full-time law enforcement officer. All right, just signed a contract. They're also asking to participate in the Marshall Program. All right, Calvary Chapel is participating in the Marshall Program. New Life Christian is participating in the Marshall Program. Merritt Island Christian um, High School is participating, or Christian School is participating in the Marshall Program. Temple Baptist. I already have two full Marshall classes ready to go with private schools because they get it. They understand that we are in a time we've never been in before. And when you find yourself in a place you've never been in before, you have to do things you've never done before to be successful. And that's where we are. So those are the four layers. That's what we're doing. Um, as I said, I recommended we move forth on labels, or layers one, two, and three immediately. But uh, through the school board's initiative, they're bringing the fourth layer across. Now let me tell you how many volunteers we're looking at. The school board did a survey. They sent out a survey to 9,000 members. Some of them knew they didn't qualify before the criteria, so they didn't respond to the survey. 1,707 members of the school board, uh, of, the, of the school employees, BPS employees, responded. 1,707. Of those, <coughs> almost 600 volunteered to be marshals. Now you tell me, someplace else, where you would spit in the face of 600 volunteers that wanted to help you do something. There's no place else, all right? When people want to volunteer, it's because they're passionate about what they're doing. Those people are passionate about teaching students, but more than anything else, if you think about your teachers when you grew up, they were passionate about protecting you in every capacity. And so, and again, it's an unfortunate conversation, but it's one we must have and when we must, must deal with. So I'll open the floor to any questions, um, any suggestions, uh, anything. I've heard stories that uh, law enforcement <clears throat> over the last five or 10 years has been discouraged from uh, arresting juveniles and for things that might otherwise warrant arrest, that those things are happen 
handled now administratively, and the goal is to maybe reduce the crime rate or reduce the you know, number of people ending up in jail, especially yeah. among certain groups. Mm -hmm. What? How, how, is there any truth to that story? Yes and no. Um, the truth to that story is that has taken place in some places. Uh, mm -hmm. And it came out actually under the last president's administration that they were going to try it. And you said to try and lower the crime rate. That, that's what it was shaped as, but that's not what it really was. It was, it was designed to be an appearance that the crime rate had lowered. All right? It was designed to say we have less juvenile offenders. That's, that's my point. point. Yes, sir. You're exactly on point. And so I can tell you, in Brevard County, we, we did not buy into that. Um, and we ain't never going to buy into it. In fact, when I swear new members of my agency in, or when I promote them, he just heard this speech just a couple days ago, I tell him I want him to do four things. I want him to come to work and have fun, because I've had fun the last 39 years of my career, and if you're having fun, you're going to be successful. The second charge to them is I want you to put bad people in jail, because that's what you get paid to do. I want you to do it more professionally than everybody else, and I want you to go home safe. That's my four charges to my team. But along that line, we put bad people in jail, and I don't care. In fact, the program I talk about, the STAR program, if you're in that program and you mess up, you, you break the law, you're going to jail. And I, I don't believe in window dressing stuff. It is what it is. If they, they commit a crime, they're going to jail. Now, we do have a program here that I'm very proud of. Um, it's actually managed through Crosswinds, and it's called the Civil Citation Program. And so let's say we have a kid that um, Christmas time rolls around and there's a car load of them. They say, hey, let's go damage Christmas decorations. And so they go to people's houses and they kick in the, the, you know, the decorations and stuff and they get caught. That's, that's the type of crime that we go, okay, you're being a knucklehead. We give you an opportunity to join the civil citation program. <coughs> the civil citation program, both the, the um, uh, person that violated the law and their parents have to sign up. And it's only for kids that are under um, 18. Have to sign up to agree to do it. If they continue through all the program. Um, uh, volunteerism, all sorts of other stuff on those type of crimes, then at the end of it, once they've successfully done it, they don't have a record. If they get offended again, game over. They don't get another shot at it. It's a one-time deal, and it's only for lower-level crimes. We don't do it for, for violent crime, anything like that. Um, the, the benefits I see of that, I'll give you a perfect example. We had two kids that were arrested for stealing out of a, out of a dollar store. Um, one kid said, I'm doing it. The other kid said, he's not. Both of them wanted to go into the military. The military accepted the kid that didn't have the record, refused to accept the other kid. And so it's got its benefits. But the state, the, just in the last legislative session and the session before, said, let's give them multiple chances in the civil citation program. Mm -hmm. Well, no. That's, that's, that defeats the purpose of the program. <clears throat> and so I fought it. Some of the other sheriffs that, that kind of wear the same uniform I do, they fought it, and we were able to defeat it. Because they actually wanted to give them up to six chances in that program. And the whole intent was to make it appear that we don't have a juvenile crime problem. Right. That was the whole intent. And that's an absolute slap in the face of good, common sense people, because we do. I promise you, if we could lower juvenile crime, our crime rate, our crime rate in Brevard County has dropped 20% in the past five years. If I could get, get a grip on juvenile crime and get them to hold them accountable, I could knock it down another 20%, guaranteed. Another comment. My understanding of the situation in South Florida was that this student uh, laid down his weapon and tried to sneak out with the other kids. Mm -hmm. He didn't go out with a, a blaze of gunfire. He, he maybe was not suicidal. Maybe he was not even mentally ill. Maybe he was just, I mean, is it fair to speculate that he, he, he would have been amenable to some correction or discipline that may have never happened? If, you know, I don't know enough about him to, to really speak about that. Um, I can tell you that he did get through, um, uh, from what I'm told, he got through the, the perimeter and was able to get to another location um, where they got him at. But I don't know how it all happened. And it, it has been such a jumbled mess of, of um, you know, just the, the information that's coming out is coming in all different different angles. And, um, I haven't seen the exact report yet that says this is what played out. This is what happened. But I can tell you this, from everything I have heard about this, this kid, um, he was a pressure cooker. It was, it was just, it was getting more and more and more and more and more, it was growing. And there were some, in my opinion, there were some missed chances for intervention, um, without question. Yes, sir? As a parent, if you have a concealed weapons permit, have a gun in your car, and you're picking your child up on a school campus, what do you do with your weapon? I think the law, and Jake, you know, I think the law, if you, if you're
you're in your car and you're not getting out of your car, you're okay with it. Okay. Uh, but if you if you step out of it, then then you've um, uh, gone onto the campus. But I think like the bus loop and the pickup loop and stuff, you're okay with it. Um, you know, one of the other concerns, and we tried to fix it in this last legislation, is um, uh, our churches that have schools um, there. Since they have the classification of a school, then um, they uh, they're they're a school all the time. And so Sunday morning service, um, they're still a school. But you so, can't walk into the office. Well, that that's exactly right. So we're trying to fix that. It is it is problematic. But I will tell you this: one of the things that I'm offering to all of our churches that have schools is send people to me. I'll train them as marshals, and then you can have people at your services and everything else that are there um, uh, ready to go. So um, we we got to do everything we can. Um, and I will tell you this: you I believe in my heart. To do that? Is that what if, if the church says these people are tasked with church security for us, then then I'm going to train them as marshals um, and, and bring them in. I'm taking that on me. There's no state statute that covers that. I'm covering it uh, from that. So um, somebody said, oh, you may get sued. I get sued every day of my life. <laughs> you know? The best part of it is I'm still settling lawsuits from when Phil Williams was sheriff you know, 12 years ago. So there's a good chance I'll be long gone before any of these lawsuits ever get. Uh, I mean, I, hopefully. So. How, how do we contact you about that? Uh, um, you can call. Um, where do we want them to call? Probably, probably send an email. So do, do this for me. If, you're, if your organization, your church is interested in doing that, send, uh, send an email to lindsay.deaton, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, dot Deaton, D-E-N. -D -E E A T O N at B C S O dot U S and then Lindsay will get it to uh, me and, and uh, um, if you uh, if you need tickets to any good football games or anything like that, <laughs> uh, one stop shop yeah one stop shop so, uh, yeah so uh, what else can I answer for you what is your personal in depth feeling with all this political stuff mm -hmm. worrying about what you say or when you yeah I pretty much. I, I, I didn't get the memorandum about as a politician you should worry about what you say. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you feel about this assault weapon thing? Oh, I'm absolutely against it. I mean, look, um, Columbine, they use shotguns, all right? Um, uh, you know, you look at some of these shootings and, and it's handguns and everything else. It's not the gun, all right? It is not the gun that does the killing. It doesn't matter how many bullets it holds. It doesn't matter any other aspect of it. If, I lay, if I've, I've got an AR-15 myself, if I lay it on that table and nobody picks it up and does anything dumb with it, it's not going to hurt a, a single soul. By the same measure, I can lay a knife there. I can lay any other thing there. Hey, what about vans? What about, you know? So it's, you know, I, I, using that mentality, yeah. Car, you know, when you're using that mentality of, oh, we got to outlaw this, the reality is, well, then we're going to outlaw vans. And we're going to outlaw knives. And if we look at 9-11, we're going to outlaw box cutters and on and on and on. So to me, what we have to do is a lot of people say, do you believe we should have gun control? We have gun control. We have measures that certain people go through when they want to get a gun that, that follow the right procedures. Criminals don't. So we, it's not gun control that we need. We need criminal control and we need mental health. Mm -hmm. And I, I will tell everybody, our mental health system in this country is broken. Throw the baby out with the bath and start anew. And if you want to ask me when it got broken, I don't know the exact date, but I can tell you when states decided that it was more important in the mental health world to save money than it was to save lives. Because if you, most of you will remember, I don't, I don't know where you grew up at, but I grew up here in the state of Florida, and we had a place called Chattahoochee. And I, I don't know how many of you remember that. I remember because my parents used to threaten to send me there all the time. <laughs> but Chattahoochee was a state-ran facility for mental health. And it wasn't about saving money. But then all of a sudden, as we did in a lot of different, different realms, we decided it was more important to save money than it was to save lives. And there are things that, trust me, government wastes money on. I'll be the first to tell you that as a taxpayer, I'm offended by some of the stuff I see them wasting money on. Amen. But when it comes to saving lives, you can't spend enough money to save a life. I just I believe that in my heart. We need and taxes. So, huh? We need taxes. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, you, you look at this and you go, all right, it's where government, in my opinion, makes their mistake. And I'm proud to tell you, I don't make this mistake. Um, I, when, I, when I got elected, how I manage money didn't change from how I manage it in my house. Because I live off of two things, my wants and my needs. And they are never the same. And this is the way I do my budget. There are things we want and there are things we need. We get the things we need first. If we've got some extra money, 
we get those things we want that would be nice to have that maybe makes the day a little bit easier. But if somebody says, well, give me an example of your wants and needs. Easy to do. I want a Rolex. I need a watch. All right? That's the difference. And that's how I run my budget. And if more people would run their budgets that way, and I'm not being critical of anybody because I don't know their budgets, but if more people would run their budgets that way and stop, stop some of this frivolous spending, we have the money we need to do the things we need. Uh, I promise it. Sheriff, I have the sense that the school board wants to do the right thing. They're behind you on this. They, they want to have the public behind them. And so far, for the most part, who's shown up is people who are uh, um, malintended, liberal, you know, whatever you want to call them. But basically, they're there to, to try to uh, do gun control. Right. You yeah. know? And, and, they, and they're afraid of guns, and they don't want guns anywhere near the schools. And that's who's kind of been taking the agenda of these meetings. So unless right. people like us are showing up. And you're exactly right. Yeah. And, you know, here, um, here, here's the other part of that. Um, and, and you're dead on point. I mean, that is the exact um, analogy of what's happening. Um, people that just think something's common sense don't go out and do marches and don't go to meetings and everything else because they're sitting at home going, well, I can see how simple that is. It's a choice. Everybody else ought to be able to see it. The people that are angry about something, whether their agenda is they want gun control or they, they want to get somebody out of office, whatever their agenda is, they're the ones that are going down and being the voice. And unfortunately, they're the ones that are being heard. Now, in the meeting they just had in Palm Bay, um, the, the forum down there, um, it was pretty split. It was pretty divided. So my, my encouragement would be, um, uh, this is your community. Get out and speak your mind. Go to these meetings. Tell, tell them what you feel. Email them. Let them know how you feel. If your schedule won't allow you to go in, let them know how you feel. Regardless, there may be people in this room, and, and there probably is, that don't support the Marshall Program. They just don't think it's the right thing. And that's okay, because I, I will tell you, I'm a big believer in that if everybody's sitting at the table thinking alike, somebody's not thinking. So it's good to have these other opinions. It's good to have a barrier. But at the end of the day, my 39 years of law enforcement experience and my team that I'm so blessed to be surrounded by tell me to share if this is the best way to instantly address a threat. Because I promise you, when, when the call from 9-11 comes in, we're minutes away, all right? And even, even a, a deputy on a school campus, and the size of some of our campuses, they're, they're three minutes away. If they're, if they're out at the football field and it starts happening in the front office, they're minutes away from where it happens at. And so, um, as I tell everybody, the best law enforcement agencies in the country have response times in minutes, but a violent criminal will take your life in a second. And so you have to be ready to defend yourself. And if you, if you look at the Waffle House one, the, the young man that was so heroic in his actions, he got a chance. He saw an opportunity. But if, if not for the, the either the, the gun mis, misfired or the person was having trouble reloading, whichever it was, that opportunity didn't exist and he could have been next. And so, you know, we have to be able to not say, I'm looking for an opportunity. We have to be able to make that opportunity. Sure. That's, that's the difference. So, what else? What else can I answer for? I don't know. Either, either or. I just want to say thank you. I know you've been putting the sheriff's cars at the church parking lot in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of questions the first Sunday that happened at church. Right. But uh, people really appreciate it. Yeah, now, um, yeah. right after the incident in Texas, I, I talked to all of our commanders. I said, I want our people sitting in the church parking lots writing reports. Um, we're doing the same thing at the schools now. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to be our, I'm telling our team at the schools, uh, get out, go have lunch in the cafeteria, make yourself visible, um, do do as much as you can um, to do it, and that's that's what we're trying to do right now. But thank you, yes, sir. I, I moved out here last year from Illinois, and I know one of the towns just north of Chicago, I think about a month ago, decided to have their town ban. Um, I think it was just semi-automatic weapons. Right. And, I, and, I, and so when we talk about showing up at these things, that all of a sudden that sparked my thought, and I thought, well, that's because the people who might support the idea of having semi-automatic weapons didn't show up at the meetings or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you know, you guys look at Chicago, you see yeah. it on TV. Yeah. That's a place where they have the strictest law, gun control yeah. laws, and it doesn't make a difference in that yeah. city. Yeah, oh yeah, you're right. I was just in Chicago not long ago. And I, had, I, I had my gun on under my shirt and everything. And one of my buddies said, you know you're in Chicago, you're not supposed to be carrying a gun. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. So, <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I heard that about the policy up there. But, uh, yeah, so. What else? What else can I answer for you? Anything else? It seems like a lot of the motivation of people that do these kind of things is to see themselves on the TV and get written about. You're talking about the, the shooters? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, as I, as we, we just kind of started talking about this in our presentations. Um, it doesn't matter what their motivation is. Whether they're motivated by terrorism, whether they're motivated by a mental health disorder, um, whether they're motivated because they've been bullied, or whether they're motivated because they're angry at their spouse. Regardless of their motivation, their goal 
is to create the largest body count possible, splash their name all over the news, and, and let everybody think that they were something for however long it was. Um, you know, as long as we continue to just glamorize these people, and, and it's an unintentional glamorization, but you're giving them notoriety, you're giving them, and the next person that's sitting there is going, oh wow, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna outdo that. I think the number right now, what was the number in Vegas? What was it, 50, 56 or something like that, 56? So, you know, that's the number um, that, that somebody in their sick, evil, twisted mind is sitting there going, I gotta figure out how to do 57, um, you know, from it, so. And, you know, you can talk about gun control, you can talk about mental health, you can talk about whatever else. But at some point, we just have to get down to the basics and say, these acts are happening because they have evil in their heart. Mm -hmm. And we, and we in this room, we in this community, we in this country, <clears throat> need to start getting back to the basics. And we were talking about it a little while ago. And, and quite, quite frankly, uh, the three Ps as I call them, all right? That's prayers, patriotism, and parenting. We need to get back to those because we've gotten away from them. And if we don't get back to them, something's going to, something's really bad going to happen even worse than we already are. Our media isn't any help because if somebody does something, they continuously put on that. And he says, look at there, I'm on TV all the time. Oh, sure. If, yeah. if they nip that in the bud, yeah. they want to sell advertisement and get people to look at the yeah. dumb advertisement. And, and you're exactly right. Here's how they sell advertisement. All right, it's, it's um, and I often refer to myself as clickbait um, <laughs> because that's what it becomes. It's called clickbait. And, and what they want to do is be able to tell the people they're trying to sell advertisements to, we have 400,000 people a week that, that hit on our site, that click on our site. So every time you click on one of those stories, well, essentially what you're doing is feeding into the clickbait scenario. And so, um, and that's sad, that's unfortunate. Many of us in this room remember the days where it was just, what happened? It wasn't driven by an agenda. It wasn't driven by needing to make money. It was driven by wanting to deliver the news. And I'm not being critical of, of the media because I have some really great media partners. I really do. But their industry has created this spiral. Um, and, and then you, you look at all the different types of social media outlets and everything out that are out there. And you know, listen, um, we survive uh, very well on social media. It's got its positives, you know. With the push of a button on our Facebook page, between the two Facebook pages, we reach 120,000 people with the push of a button. That's an incredible delivery system. But just like everything else in the world, too much of any good thing becomes a bad thing. So, all right, so I'm not even looking over my shoulder, and I know that there is a lady behind me that's staring me down. Um, so I've been ignoring her for the past 10 minutes, and uh, I'm pretty good at that. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with two things. One, as I told you, our crime rates dropped 20% in the last five years. Um, and while that is a great thing, I'm not satisfied. All right? I want our crime rate down even more. I, I want to know that we can push it down as far as we can. It takes us working together. It takes us as partners to be able to do it. So when we're pushing out information telling you what kind of crime trends are out there, you guys are saying, I'm not going to become a victim of this because I know what to do. We're going to push that down even more. The second thing that I'll close with is our animal services um, our animal services team is doing amazing stuff. We are, we are a no-kill community because of their efforts out there. And when people, when, when people say that um, government shelters can't be no-kill, in fact, it's kind of funny. Uh, Matt Reed, when he was at Florida Today, wrote an article, an editorial that said, government shelters can never be no-kill. His last day at Florida Today, before he went to the school board, and I called him up and I said, I know what your last editorial ought to be about. He goes, what? How you were wrong about you can't be no kill if you're going to shelter. He didn't write that. All right, I'm just telling you that. But he was wrong. We are a no kill shelter. We went from a live release rate of 55% to a live release rate of 97%. We have 97% of our animals are finding forever homes. That's amazing. In fact, we're one of very few in the country that do it. In fact, my team right now is getting asked to travel all over the country and teach other government run shelters how to do it. And you know what? We're doing that because I, I, I told everybody from the very beginning, I couldn't stand before God and tell him I killed an innocent creature. I just couldn't do that. And so we had to become no-kill because uh, I'm going to be standing before God one day. All right? And that's not one of the things I'm going to have to answer for. I can assure you that. Father. So, um, but with that, I'm going to close out for our 1,500 members. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you for all the amazing support you give us. We are truly blessed to work in this community as law enforcement officers. And uh, I, I can tell you that this is, this is the, the job I've always wanted in my life, 
and uh, it has lived up to being everything I hoped it would. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for these brave men and women that come and bring a message. And Father, I ask this coming week that each and every one of us lift these people up, put a shield of protection and a blanket around them there in the park to provide for them uh, and for us to carry the message to our neighborhood, the message of our schools and our children and our grandchildren and the things that we need to be responsible for. Thank you so much again for this time and this day and these men that come and, and, and all of these wonderful people that work so hard. And thank you for the people of, in the Washington area, uh, the, the politicians, senators, and congressmen, uh, not only on the local level, but on the national level. Provide for them and let's lift them up each and every day. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, Father, guys, real quick, next week we got Dave Terrellman, is that right? From Faith Lutheran. Okay? That, and then I got one other bit of information. Right. We've got a pig foot jar. We've got a pickle jar, whatever you call it. What do you call it, Sheriff? It uh, looks like a pretzel jar. Okay, pretzel <laughs> jar. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, like I'm not going to recognize food, right? <laughs> we, have to provide, we have to provide for the, the, the lady that's help and serve us like a free, free meal today. Can I share one more thing with you? Yes, Just real quick. Yes. May 12th. Yeah. May 12th, what time? Starting what time? Starts 9 a.m. Over on Stadium. Um, the route will be posted and stuff. We are doing the first time in, uh, in our community we've done it. It's going to be a law enforcement appreciation parade. Huh. And um, uh, all the different agencies throughout the county are going to have their, their resources in there. Uh, businesses are putting in floats and everything else. It's going to end at what we call the Battle of the Badges. Um, and it's going to be a, a kind of a, a park setting where the different agencies and vendors are going to be competing against each other mm. with a chili cook-off, a barbecue cook-off, and a cupcake um, yeah. challenge. So um, I will tell you that I... Uh, judged a cupcake challenge one time. I will never do it again. <laughs> I, I didn't know that you're not supposed to eat all the cupcakes. <laughs> About cupcake 15, I slipped into a diabetic coma and uh, uh, didn't make it through the rest of the judgment. However, I've never had that happen with chili or barbecue, so I'll be on that judgment. Um, come out, bring your families, please share it with everybody you know. It's on our Facebook page. Um, uh, Space Coast Daily is doing a lot of advertising on it and everything for us. Uh, bring your families, bring your, your kids, your grandkids, bring everybody out, and uh, come support your local law enforcement officers. So, appreciate everybody. Thank See you. Guys. Thank you.